Jose oh, this is brothers, brothers and sisters. We come together again as one mind, one body, and one spirit as we want to open our Hebrew Bibles today to uh, Jonah chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 and then we're going to tack on verse 10 uh, otherwise it gets to be a kind of an extended reading and we got a lot to cover today so we want to shorten that up a little bit. So we're actually going to have two readings from the Hebrew Bible today because of, uh, you know, it's Martin Luther King Jr. weekend and we got we got some stuff going on and we need to talk about it. So, uh, our first reading is from Jonah chapter 3 verses 1 through 5. And the word of God came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim it to the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of God. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast. And everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed God's mind about the calamity that God had said God would bring upon them. And God did not do it. Our second reading today is also, like I said, from the Hebrew Bible. And it's a psalm, part of the psalm. We want to turn to Psalm 62, 5 through 12. Psalm 62, 5 through 12. For God alone my soul waits in silence. For my hope is from God. God alone is my rock and my salvation. My fortress I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge, is in God. Trust in God at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before God. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Put no confidence in extortion and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Once God has spoken twice, have I heard this, that power belongs to to God. And steadfast love belongs to you, O God. For you repay to all according to their work. Here are the words of the Hebrew Bible. <laughs> we are, as it is said, we are our own worst enemy. Facing change is often a very great challenge for many people. Um, it's ironic in that sense because the one true constant of creation is change. Uh, whether it's fast, like uh, running out of a gallon of milk with a bunch of kids around, or whether it's slow, grass growing, in the spring. Change is always happening. And we have to deal with that. We have to face it. Every day, cells in our bodies die off and are reborn. So that, according to what the scientists say, literally, physically, every seven years we are a new person. It's a seven-year cycle, which 
is very sacred to uh, Indian peoples. So we are reborn, physically reborn every seven years, and yet our bodies remember, the cells remember all the challenges that we have each time we are reborn. And so we have to deal with the changes that occur as we progress in our lives. And, you know, people oftentimes feel a deep, desperate need to feel safe and secure, and so they don't want to face change. In our readings today, we hear a great story about change. Now, those of us who know this story and know the history behind it know that Jonah was, by every possible interpretation, the reluctant messenger. He did not want to go to Nineveh. He did not want to be God's messenger. He knew the awesome responsibility came with that. And, of course, being a Jew, he knew what happens to prophets. The Jewish people at that time had a long history of not being very nice towards prophets, especially the good ones. And so he wasn't the least bit interested in being on that, on that wagon train. And uh, so he argued with God about it. And, of course, God is God. <laughs> and you can argue. That's okay. You can argue with God. It's all right. But, you know, God's God. So, uh, Jonah, as we hear in the reading here this morning, he got up and he did what God wanted. And so, uh, he took off towards uh, Nineveh, and Nineveh was a huge city. Three days' walk. Even at a slow pace, we're talking at least 30 miles wide. That's a big city. And of course, you know, I can walk 10 miles if I'm hard put to it. I used to be able to a long time ago, but I probably couldn't do it anymore. But, uh, you know, younger people, full of youth and vinegar, could do that. Uh, 20 miles even. So Nineveh was no small city. It was huge. And so, you think about how many people are living in this city. And it kind of smacks a little bit of a place where there wasn't a whole lot of hospitality going on. Pretty much like Sodom and Gomorrah, where hospitality had been thrown out with the laundry. And uh, people were being pretty selfish. People were uh, doing what they wanted to do. They had their own self-interest in mind. And because of that, they were, you know, feeling pretty good about themselves. They were living high on the hog, because in the city back in those days, being in the city, the only people who were in the city were the wealthy. We're talking agrarian culture here. People in the lowlands and the poor were dirt poor. People in the city were the people with power, money, prosperity. They were bullying people, exploiting others for their own personal gain. And then, of course, they had their slaves and their servants with them. And so, uh, yeah, they were they were doing pretty pretty good there for themselves. At least they thought they were. But what we're hearing here in this message is, and of course, being in that particular era, the writer of Nicodemus here uh, was thinking about in the context that whenever bad luck was coming upon people, it was because God willed it. And of course, we know in Galatians chapter six, verse seven that Paul reminded the people that you reap what you sow. He's talking about, you know, if you're going to exploit others for personal gain, that's going to come full circle and slap you right upside the head, figuratively speaking, of course. And so uh, this is what we're seeing in Jonah in this reading today. We're seeing a reality check of choices. And what happens as the consequences of those choices, as the Ninevites had to face it, things were bad. Things were really bad. Chaos, lawlessness, craziness going on left and right, and people living it up in the city. And Jonah, who, having to face change, 
finally said, okay, I guess I can handle this. I'll go. And he went. He entered the city and he carried God's message. And you know, you, you read it and you think, well, okay. Maybe this guy, he might not have been 100% into this whole thing because he was reluctantly going in the first place. So uh, he might not have been totally fired up. But when he got there, he started proclaiming what God was saying. And we hear that he basically said one sentence over and over again walking through the streets. And here's the, here's the interesting part of that, about this. The amazing part about this is whatever actually occurred there, they got it. They believed. They understood the awesome power of God. And they understood that they were going to suffer the consequences of their actions. It was time to be held accountable. They had reaped, they were about to reap what they had sown. And they weren't real thrilled about that idea. And they were willing to change their ways. Every single one of them. It says the whole city, everybody, believed. And they humbled themselves in that way. They realized that they were being their own worst enemies. They realized that they had been acting out self-sabotaging behaviors that was making their lives harder than it needed to be. And they were getting ready to be miserable and they didn't want it anymore. They didn't want to face that. And so they, they humbled themselves before God. They put on the, the sackcloth and the ashes and they cried out for forgiveness of their wrongdoings. Now, Dr. Walter E. Jacobson, a psychiatrist, is an expert on self-sabotaging behaviors. And he points out that there are a half a dozen or so primary characteristics that all human beings act out to avoid having to face changing their ways. He calls them, and they are called because as a, as a, as a counselor, as a therapist, I'm very much aware of these. Uh, you know, defense mechanisms which uh, people put in place to justify their actions, justify their beliefs, their value systems that uh, help them to avoid facing truth, facing God's will. And the first and foremost of these is denial. You know, all know that phrase, denial ain't just a river in Egypt, right? And it's true. Denial is, for many people, uh, the number one defense mechanism for refusing to face what people are telling them what they're seeing with their own eyes and hearing with their own hear, ears about how they are acting out self-sabotaging behaviors through their thoughts, through their feelings, through their actions, which is making their lives harder than they need to be. And not only in doing that, they are also making the lives of everyone around them harder than they need to be. That's the number one. The second is blaming others. According to Dr. Jacobson, blaming others is right up there in the top ten list. Mm. It's called the blame game. Pia Melody points that out. She calls it the blame game. Where people point everybody else's fault. Their bad situation is everybody else's fault. Now there are some people in this world where that is a valid justification. I know many Indian peoples on the res is that I have lived and worked that uh, do not have access, accesses, access to resources, do not have access to education, do not have access to food, to clothing, to safe shelter. I know of one single mother who had to light a fire in her living room in a big open container because there was a great big huge hole in the roof and it was the only way they could get heat because the landlord 
was such a bully that the landlord refused to patch the hole in the roof and fix the fireplace. That's reality. But for most people, especially living here in contemporary North America and here in Oklahoma, where we're at here in Tulsa and surrounding areas, that's not a valid reason for not wanting to face change. Blaming others is a good scapegoat when you want to don't have to look at yourself. You don't want to look in the mirror and say, oh crap, I really am doing this. Victimization. People think they're the victim. And I know a lot of people this way. I know a fellow that I was working with and he's very good at this. Everything is everybody else's fault. Everything that bad that happens to me is because other people are doing it. Well, I'm just saying. Another one is uh, what he calls shooting the messenger, like Nineveh and Jonah. Now, what if, what if Jonah had gone in there and the Nineveh, those living in Nineveh, the Ninevites, had said, "Man, shut up and get out of town. If you don't, we're going to stone you," because they did that to prophets back then. If they hadn't believed. John, we could be hearing the story about how he got stoned in Nineveh and how it was wiped out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that that's a pretty pretty heavy uh, possibility, a pretty real deal. People feel sorry for themselves. They get on their pity pots. Mm -hmm. And they go after whoever's telling them, hey, you know, it's not okay for you to do this. And they go after them and hurt them. Even to the point of where I've got people out where I live shooting off machine guns and detonating bombs to scare everybody into submitting to their will. We've got terrorism right here in Oklahoma by white people who are not belonging to ISIS. And nobody do anything about it. Another, Dr. Jacobson points out another significant defense mechanism, and that is living in the past. And as I get older and work with more people in, in uh, declining years, geriatrics, I see this a lot. People living in the past. They, they lost their dreams, or they, they snuffed their dreams. They weren't so motivated to change. They didn't take advantage of the opportunities God gave them. And in so doing, they never fulfilled their potential, never manifested a new life for themselves and their families, and so they live in the past. They remember early, later, earlier times when things were better. And I get into deep psychoanalysis about that, but it's not the point. The reality is people live in the past in order to prevent themselves from having to go out and change things now because there is never too late a time to make change to help make things better for yourself and everyone else. And in the psalmist, we see a different story here. We see instruction to the people. Uh, Marcia Wilfong here points out that Psalm 62 is a confession of trust in God. But the message here is, if you trust in God, you will be able to have the strength and the courage to face whatever changes that you need to make in your mind, in your heart, in your actions, that will bring good luck upon yourself and those who live around you to help improve the quality of life for everyone, and not just yourself. But if you trust in God, opportunities will be presented to you to make those changes. And that's what the psalmist is affirming this. The psalmist is saying, put your trust in God. It says right there in verse 8, trust in God at all times. God is going to make something good come from this if you trust. And I'm here to tell you, it's real easy for me to sit here 
in this room or out there in my family or friends, whatever, and say that I trust in God. It's a whole different ball game to say that to God. How many of you have actually sat down and said, God, I trust you. Something to think about. Something to think about. Because when you say it to God, God knows whether you mean it or not. And you can grow in your trust by affirming that you trust in God. Live as if it's as if it's so, and it will be made so. Live as though you trust in God, and you will trust in God. And that's what the people of Nineveh did. They trusted in God. And by the grace of God, it says right here, God let go, forgave all the wrongdoings, wiped the slate clean, and did not overturn the city of Nineveh. It's a great message of the significance of what happens when you do trust in God and change your ways to focusing on the needs of others and not just yourself, of living according to God's will and God's intention for us and not ourselves. And God's will is very clear, very simple. Give of yourselves that others may live. We don't tell them what to do, how to do it, we set that good example for them to follow. And through that example, we inspire others to want to live as we live, to know what we know. And we learned all this from those who came before us. And so we remember this. And like what God did with Nineveh, an entire city wasn't wiped out. Imagine what God will do for you. In this day and age, right now, here today, I'm wearing this hoodie because we live in a community in the state of Oklahoma, a state of what is becoming very, very close to being like tyranny and oppression. Because today, this weekend of Martin Luther King, an extremist politician has called for an emergency vote to ban hoodies, to punish people who supposedly use these in, the, in, in committing a crime, but the law is so vague, so unclear, and actually redundant that this bill is, is just, it's profiling. Profiling African Americans, profiling American Indians, People who are suffering low self-esteem and low self-worth can easily now be targeted for wearing their hoodies to hide their faces from the people for whatever reason. No justification. Anybody can make it up and say, oh yeah, hey, he's going to break the law, so let's get him. Well, the one that I'm wearing right now, this hoodie that I'm wearing right now, was issued by the United States Department of Veterans Affairs, Muskogee VA Hospital. Because there are a lot of veterans like myself who on occasion feel the need to go unnoticed. And so we wear our hoodies. And we have them. We wear them to stay warm, especially in the really cold times. That hard wind comes in from the north, it goes through everything. So I wear my hoodie when I'm outside working in my pasture. I wear it at work from time to time. Do I like to be targeted because I'm a disabled American veteran and I'm wearing a hoodie? No. And I know the other veterans in this state don't either. But that's the lunacy that is going on today, and it's all about 
oppressing minorities. It has no place in God's community. And I don't care how much those politicians call themselves Christians. Christians don't oppress other people. Christians don't discriminate against other people. Christians don't commit racism for their own personal gain. That is God's law. And so we wear these now. Ministers all over Oklahoma wearing these this morning in protest against this unjust laws that are, in fact, creating self-sabotaging behavior and will, like Nineveh, bring the wrath of God upon the state of Oklahoma. I absolutely 100% believe that. People in this legislature better change their ways, or they will face this same story in their lifetimes. So it is. So when we trust in God, we gain the strength and courage to move forward with changing our thoughts and our feelings and our behaviors in a good way. That will help to let go of all those self-sabotaging behaviors and by the grace of God. To help improve the quality of our lives and all the lives of the people around us. And who knows how many of us. God, walk in beauty. Amen.